First of all, my name is Angela Tollerson, and I help lead the Flathead Valley Beekeeping Association. It's a free association. We don't actually collect dues right now. I encourage you guys to come to any of our meetings, which are the last Tuesday of each month. Um, in the second floor of the Flathead County Health Department. If you want a reminder of that, we have flyers downstairs. We have a table. Please come collect a flyer um, and just come to the meetings. A lot of people research about bees for a year or two before they actually get them, and I highly encourage that. Um, but it's not necessary. You can just launch straight in because we have mentors through our club, and we're happy to mentor anyone. And um, if you go to our Facebook page of the same name, Flathead Valley Beekeepers Association, I do have a, a post at the top, um, an announcement of um, kind of a beekeeping 101, everything that I might need, including books. So what are all the best books? And I have, I've touched on every possible approach you might have from beekeeping, from just basic 101 to natural beekeeping to wear a hives, to lay in hives, lots of different resources there, equipment. And also, if you're here wondering where you can buy your bees from, we do have someone selling bees from Great Falls that are bringing the nukes over here. And so you can take advantage of that and you can get the phone number from me downstairs if you want to and the gentleman who's doing that. So. <clears throat> On we go into my talk today about sustainable beekeeping and restorative agriculture. Um, I, so I um, applied and was approved to do cost share through the local NRCS to do a pollinator habitat. And when I went down to California in order to speak with a woman who's doing the pollinator habitats, she warned me that there's a bigger problem that we have with our pollinator habitats and is that even though we're putting those around some of our agriculture land in order to improve the pollinator health, they're finding that those pollinator plants are absorbing the pesticides, specifically the neonicotinoids, that are being put in the plantations that they're around. And because they're absorbing it, the bees are still getting those pesticides, even though they're not, those, those aren't the target plants they originally were intended for. So Jonathan Lundgren, he's an ex-USDA entomologist, and he has a great YouTube video out there. If you, if you um, search regenerative agriculture and beekeeping, he's talking to a beekeeping club at one point, and he lays out a lot of these points that I'm gonna give to you. The reason I say ex-USDA entomologist is because he was run out of the SDA is the story that is told. And it's because he talked about how the way that we are doing our agriculture in this country is a paradigm that needs to shift. Because people always come to me and say, how do I keep my bees alive? Why aren't the bees surviving? Is it true the bees aren't surviving? And every single time you start to work your way back down the ladder, you find out that everything at the root is agriculture. And so some of the things he talked about, 60% of Earth's insect biomass has been lost in the last 27 years. 67%. Now you have to realize that for every one, and Jonathan talks about this, every one negative bug we have out there, there are thousands of beneficial bugs. So that's the biomass that's being lost, are thousands of beneficial bugs. And you have to realize too, there are creatures that we hold dear to us that eat those bugs. And those creatures are being affected by that biomass loss, right? 15% of our land is corn, soy, wheat, and alfalfa. Nothing the bees or any pollinators can benefit from, right? Now you could say, oh, they can get from alfalfa. No, because um, if you're farming alfalfa for hay, you always cut it the moment the blooms first appear because otherwise you lose all of your protein into the flowers. And so the, it's never there for the bees. Now, if you're doing alfalfa for seed, that's a different story. But if 15% of our land right now is being used for these, what's left over for the pollinators. Here's the thing, our current agriculture is only maintained through agrochemicals, only. It's an addiction and it is not sustainable. These four are not sustainable, corn, soy, wheat, and alfalfa, the way that we're doing them. Now, a bigger problem, the monarch butterflies are at 10% of their historic populations. We've lost 90% of our mo monarch butterflies. What have we lost them to? Two things. One, people using Roundup on the milkweed that they, um, where, where they're most commonly foraging. And two, neonicotinoids that I talked about. The neonicotinoids are being pulled up into the plants. Now, we, we, we refer to them, in short, as neonics. 
And neonicotinoids and miticides are indiscriminate nerve agents. They are indiscriminate with what they're killing. They kill insects, all insects. Now what they do is they call, they've done, you might have seen where they've released a study where the companies have done studies on bees and they said, we've determined it safe. Well, technically, no, what they released was that we determined that it is not lethal. Now, there's a subtext to that. There's lethal and there's sublethal. And what we're finding is that no, it does not kill 50% or more of the insects from when they're, the moment they're exposed to it. It's not an immediate poisoning, but there are sublethal effects, meaning it accumulates over time as they keep bringing it back into the hive, especially the pollen. They're feeding the larvae and um, with this proteins that are infected with the neonics. And here are some of the effects. Now, Jonathan Lundgren says, today, agriculture has acted like a meteorite hitting the earth, and humans are selecting for species that can survive in an agrochemical-laden, highly simplified landscape. Many insect species have become casualties of our decisions, and we're reshaping biological communities on a rapid time scale the planet has never experienced before. Honeybees are becoming one such casualty. So I went to the Apomonia International Beekeeping Conference um, in 2019 in Montreal. It's kind of the uh, Olympics of beekeeping. It's only every two years, and countries have to put in a bid that they want it hosted in their country, and so it moves to a different country each time. And when I went to this, I saw some, so many of the talks. They're all 15-minute talks all day for several days. And alteration of survival and oxidative balance by subchronic exposure of overwintered honeybees to insecticide, fungicide, and herbicide combinations. Fungicide exposure to honeybees in almonds. Chronic exposure to neonicotinoids and honeybee health. Effect of sublethal exposure to thiomophoxum and nosema infections, and that is a type of a neonicotinoid there. Field analysis of actual exposure of honeybees to neonicotinoids, fungicides, and herbicide. I could keep going on over and over and over. These were scientists who were talking to agriculture and beekeepers who were showing up from all over the world to talk about how neonics really are sublethal to our bees and that we cannot trust the reports that were put out, by the way, that were funded by the companies that own the neonicotinoids, that it was safe, right? So another gentleman I want to introduce you to, Gabe Brown. He did a TED Talks. You can Google him and find him. He talks about the downfall of agriculture. Well, how did this happen? Well, first, way back in the last century, we were doing heavy tilling, which leads to lower nutrients in your soil. When that leads to lower nutrients, what do you have to do? Synthetic fertilizers, right? When you put synthetic fertilizers in, what do you get? More weeds. So then what do you have to do? Well, then you use herbicides. What happens when you use herbicides? Well, there are metal binding chelates in herbicides. And when the binds to those, those metal binding chelates make an unhospitable environment, in come the funguses. So then you use fungicides. Well, the fungicides are microbiology harming and they're pest breeding grounds, what is what they leave. So then what do you need? Well, then you go to pesticides. Well, the pesticides kill predator insects, which are the beneficial insects, and they kill the pollinators. Pesticides are indiscriminate. We need to realize that. This has led to pollinators that are in decline, and specifically, the Varroa destructor mite has permeated our bees to the point that everyone thinks the mite is what is killing my hives. Well, sure, ultimately, they're the final outcome, but what was happening in those bees leading up to that that caused them to be able to not defend themselves in a way that bees have been able to for millions of years whenever they were put up against something that invaded them, whether a virus or a bacteria or a predator. So, is it a problem or a symptom? Well, Varroa parasites feed on fat bodies, which is the equivalent of our endocrine system, like our liver, which affects the bee's protein-dependent abilities and vectors viruses. The bee historically has been able to combat these viruses. These are viruses that have been endemic in bees all the time. Deformed wing virus has always been around. It just has not been able to gain a foothold until it's been weakened. The bee has been weakened. Um, entered, it, uh, the Varroa entered in the U.S. in the light, late 1980s, and you can see there um, little red varroa attached to the bee, riding on the bee. 
Um, we call them phoretic when they're in that state, meaning they're riding around on the bees. Um, now, parasites don't usually kill their hosts. It's evolutionary disadvantageous, right? A parasite usually lives with their host and doesn't kill them. But now they are. Why? What's the difference? Well, we place insecticides in the hive to kill a harmful insect feeding on a beneficial insect. We're placing, when we use miticides, we are placing an insecticide in the hive. Well, how did we determine how to do that? Well, there's a threshold of insecticide by a lethal dose of 50% of the bees, that's referred to as an LD50. And so they saw how far they could go with a pesticide until they killed 50% of the bees and then they back off slightly. And so that's what you're doing when you're using any miticides, oscillic acid, formic acid, any of the commercial miticides that are being sold. You're putting in an insecticide that has the potential to kill your bee, but you're trying to do it at a slightly lower level, then we'll kill all of them. So that's, that's what you're doing. Now the parasite that has lived in the hive after you've used that insecticide or miticide is the one that survived the human mass casualty event that I just talked about with Jeff Lund or Jonathan Lundgren. Um, John Lundgren proposes the mite is a symptom and therefore nature's culling tool of general unfitness of a bee, whether from genetic or environmental lack of fitness. And in other words, poor foraging nutrition and that we interfere with that daily. So what are the consequences? Well, the nukes, which are, uh, is that short for a nucleus colony? It's a three to five frames that come um, in a colony. It costs $165 to $200 a piece in 2020, this year. Up to 44% average losses each winter are experienced in the Northern Rockies, 41% nationally. These are people who are treating their bees too, this, this percentages. They're using the insecticides, they're using the miticides. And 81% loss was reported in Montana in 2011. I was trying to remember what happened in 2011. Do you guys remember? Was that a really bad year? I can't remember. <laughs> it's a big runoff here. Yeah, it could be. I couldn't remember. Um, we repeatedly purchased nukes and packages from bees wintered in mild southern states. And then we expect them to adapt to our weather and forage windows. Right? So you need to understand, a lot of times people say, well, the reason that you can't keep bees in Montana is because they starve in March. Mm, yes and no. Often what's happening is bees that are brought up from California, Texas, which is often the bees that we get up here, they are used to being able to start their brood earlier. So what happens is they start their brood earlier, and then when a freeze comes, which we know will happen all the way till June 8th, but when a freeze comes, the bees will not recluster because their focus is on the brood. They'll try to keep the brood covered, and so they will, you know, die trying to protect something rather than cluster back up and survive. So that's often what's happening too. So that's where we're at with that. So you're probably thinking, okay, great, Angela, you told me everything that's wrong with the world. Now, what are the solutions? <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what you can do as a home and business owner, what you can do as a hobby beekeeper, as a commercial beekeeper, as a landowner, and as a farmer or gardener to improve this. First of all, sustainable solutions for the home business owner. First, leave the dandelions and the weeds please <laughs> you have to realize that the bees are the bees in our area their forage ends in the beginning of october on a good year and it doesn't start until the end of may on a bad year and it's with the dandelions and there are some plants that they can gather from a little bit earlier like our pussy willows will bloom out and stuff but the dandelions is when they get their first um, what we call um, a flow. And it's not just the honeybees. Bumbles, solitary bees, butterflies, honeybees, hoverflies, beetles, goldfinches, house sparrows. That's all their first, first real food out of the winter. So please leave them. Please do not use weed and feed. They're gorgeous. If, you're na if you think your neighbors are going to complain, and I've been there before, put out a really cute sign. You could probably get one off Etsy or make one yourself that says, we are feeding the bees. <laughs> put it right in the middle of your dandelions. People love that. You know, They're like, oh, OK, they're feeding the bees. OK, I won't you know, give them a hard time. All right. 
Don't use any pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides on plants that are in flower. If you have to use those, and I understand there are situations where those are necessary, do not use them on a plant that has any flower on them or that there might be drift nearby where there are flowers. Um, consider replacing your lawn with pollinator plants or overseeding with white clover seed. Um, the only warning I want to put out about the clover seed is that um, little barefoot, you know, <laughs> grandkids or kids running around have the potential of stepping on a honeybee and getting stung. And that happened to me a lot as a kid, and I'm still here. I survived. Um, but not everybody can, you know. You, sometimes there's unknown uh, allergies. But um, consider putting um, overseeding clover seed into your lawn. They love the clover. Um, honeybees are loyal to one plant a day, so buy plants in diverse groups. So like if you go to Hooper's and you're like, oh, I want one of those and one of those and one of those, the bees will not, within that day, that one individual bee will not hop to those different plants. She stays loyal to one particular group of plants, and that's why honeybees are so vital in pollination and agriculture, because they know that if the honeybee visits a cherry tree in the morning, she'll still be visiting cherry trees that evening, so you don't have cross-pollination going on. That's why they're so good for pollination. So definitely buy diversely, but make sure you buy in groups. You know, three to five would be um, great if you're going to buy individual perennial plants at the garden center. Um, and if you go, and if you take advantage downstairs, the Flathead Conservation District is offering a program where they will give free pollinator seed to people for anywhere up to 2,500 square feet that they want to do. And you can go down and visit with Haley or uh, Samantha. Samantha, um, about that. And um, that is going to be diverse, but there's going to be a lot of each one of those diverse plants in there within that seed packet. And that's great. Diversity is good um, when you're talking about long term because there'll be flowers blooming in May, then flowers in June, then July, then August. And so that diversity for that time lapse is wonderful. But um, don't, don't just buy one single perennial plant that said it was friendly for the bees and think you're helping the bees out. That's not exactly how it works. It does help other pollinators though. There are solitary bees that do enjoy those single plants. So I'm not telling you don't do it at all. But for the sake of honeybees, I just want to make you aware. Um, definitely grab purples, reds, blues, fragrant. The bees like fragrant. If there does not a smell to it, the bees probably won't visit it. And they love herbs. So herb gardens are great. And if you see a swarm, um, please go use the call now button at the Flathead Valley Keep, Keep, Beekeepers Association Facebook group. That will call me directly and um, I will come and retrieve that swarm safely. Or I will show you how to do it yourself. I'm happy to mentor people. Um, I will come out there as long as you have your own equipment and you say, okay, I've got these bees, what do I do with them? I will stand right there and we will help you get them in the box. No problem. All right, um, for the hobby beekeeper, don't buy bees. Now I understand if you wanna buy bees your first year because you're very intimidated. Um, I can understand why you'd wanna buy them. I did that my first year, but um, you can capture swarms for free. Now, a lot of you are probably saying, I've never seen any swarms, there's no swarms here. Oh my gosh, there are so many swarms here. I got so many calls last year about swarms and it was a bad year. I can't imagine a good year. And the bees, there are bees everywhere. There are so many commercial apiaries bringing their bees back that have pollinated from California and Washington and they are teeming and they are overflowing and they lose those bees and those bees go into people's houses and then I have to go to their house and pull them out of their siding and it's a big pain. You can put up traps to capture these free bees. I caught six of them myself last year and then I gave away several swarms to several other people in my club. Um, I think a good 15 to 20 that I gave away. And those are just the ones we're seeing. You have to realize that for every tree out there in the forest, there's a potential of bees out there. Um, so there, uh, you can use baited traps. Um, here's an example of a baited trap here that I put together. Um, I built this out of plywood. It was a free plan at horizontal, horizontalhives.com. Um, this is a special um, extra deep frame version of a beehive called a layens style, L-A-Y-E-N-S. So you can um, build these traps or you can use existing equipment that you already have. You don't have to build a trap. Um, after a swarm moves in here, um, after a week or two, um, I take the frames and I put them in their permanent home in a hive in my apiary. 
to be honest, that's not much different than driving to somebody, picking up a nuke box of bees, driving home, putting it in your apiary. You're already going to have to do that step. And so for now, I just do it for free, pull it off a tree, and move the frames into my own hive. Um, make splits and nukes from your survivors. So if you don't split or make a nuke from anything that survives in the winter, it's probably going to swarm on you. And then you're going to be out those bees. They're going to leave. So definitely make splits. You can come to our club. If you want to learn how to make splits, you can watch YouTube videos. Um, but And they, they will raise their own queen when you make the split. You don't have to have any knowledge. The bees do it all. They've been doing it for millions of years. We're good. Um, don't import queens if you can help it. I understand that a lot of people want to do a split and they immediately want to lay in queen in there because they want to get a hold of the, um, get a jump on the season and have, but if you do that, just know that that is a queen possibly from the south that is not adjusted to a Montana winter. You want your own queens, the ones that survived yourself. You want them to make a queen out of that egg. And um, like I said, we can talk more in depth. I don't have time today. Um, if you come to a meeting, we can talk about how to do splits. We're going to have a gentleman come and explain how to do that. So, But that would be the preference. You want sur local survivors. You can make more bee-centric choices, not keeper-centric when your pocketbook is not at stake. So when people ask me whether or not I treat for mites, whether I go in for all of that, I tell them, here's the thing. If you're spending $200 per nuke, I don't have a right to stand in front of you and tell you, you, should, you don't have to treat your bees because you've made an economical investment. And I don't want to tell you one, either, one way or the other because if your bees don't survive, guess who you're going to come back and blame, right? But if you're capturing your bees for free or you're getting splits from people in the club that are offering free splits each year, then you can, you'll make completely different choices than you would. All right, so I want to point out the difference between swarm collecting and swarm trapping. So here's me collecting. Let's see if this is going to play. I'm sorry about that. I don't know why it's not playing. I tested it. Well, you know what? If you go to the Facebook page, I have these videos on there. Sorry. Um, I have a video of me collecting a swarm. Essentially what's happening is there's a swarm of bees on a tree, and I'm sitting there and pulling them off with my hands and then dropping them into this trap here. And they're pretty docile. Um, so that's a little bit overwhelming for a lot of people who have never kept bees. I'm not saying that's something you have to do your first year. But what you can do for the swarm trapping, and again, this is on the Facebook page, but it is a video of this hive here absolutely covered in bees. And the bees are just moving in. And essentially what happens is um, when um, the bees decide they want to reproduce each year, and they almost always will, the queen will, um, they'll, they'll bring the queen's weight down so that she can fly by not letting her eat for a week. And they run her around on an exercise regime. And they, she runs and runs and runs. And they slim her down. And then she takes the, half the bees, and they fly, and they look for a new home. And they leave behind eggs that have been chosen to be the new queen and get capped. And so now that hive will have um, a queen. And half of the bees remain behind. And so that's technically how bees reproduce. Now you have two colonies. And, so that, and what you're capturing is the surviving queen, the queen that made it through the winter locally. Um, so how do you do this? Well, you can do it with this empty, single, deep box. So if you already have a box um, that you had kept bees in, you just put 10 frames in there. Um, have one of them have wax comb in there. The bees will love that if they can smell the wax comb, especially if there's been many brood in it. Don't put honey, no honey in there. All that will do is attract robbers, right? Not the bees. Put 10 drops, 10 drops of lemongrass essential oil on a paper towel, close it in a sandwich baggie, and then um, you just lay that in there. And um, it's a slow release because the Ziploc baggie has, is permeable, and so it will slowly release that scent. Um, why lemongrass essential oil? Well, bees have a gland on the back of them called a Nazanoff gland, and you can see them fanning when they want to attract the rest of the bees for any reason and that is the scent that they're producing is it's the same that's the same compound as the lemongrass oil and so it's attractive to the bees you set it on a stand um, you can do concrete blocks set it up a good 18 inches so that the skunks won't get at it um, or you can put it on the north side of a building so that 
morning sun and evening sun get to it. The bees seem to prefer that. Um, bees don't care for full sun. Even though we tend to put our hives in full sun, they don't care for full sun traps. They, they kind of avoid them because they feel like they get too hot. And that's their natural choice. So something that's shaded in midday, bees will appreciate. Um, now, why, in, why a building, why not a tree? Well, a lot of the swarms that I have to deal with, they tend to love houses and siding, they love it. And so um, there's a gentleman, and I have a reference for him, at, for him at the end here for you to visit his website, but he catches all of his bees against buildings and houses. He doesn't even bother with the trees anymore. He started off in the trees, he slowly, in, and now it's just convenient, he's put in by houses and the bees are still moving in. Um, if you want to put it in a tree like this picture here, you certainly can, but you don't want to mess with that telescoping cover and that bottom board and all that stuff. So all you have to do is cut a plywood bottom um, and put it, uh, screw it to the bottom and then, and then um, cut one to put to the top and then um, drill a two inch hole in the side and um, about two inches up from the bottom and then place uh, one of these discs over it. And what this does, you'll leave it to the opening. And then when you go to collect your bees, because you want to move them to the apiary after dusk, when the bees are all in, you'll just simply turn this to the ventilated side so the bees can't get out. And you'll have, um, you'll have this uh, ratchet strap holding down the top and the bottom of the whole hive. And you're just going to walk it to your apiary and set it down. And you're good to go. Um, some people also, you can see how somebody just kind of like tethered this up into a limb. Um, sometimes people will attach, they'll take a two by four and attach um, it on one side, screw it onto one side of the box. And then you can use ratchet straps and you can actually attach the two by four to the tree using the ratchet straps and the box is kind of sticking out from the tree. So that's another way you can do it. Um, all right, so what can you do as a landowner? Well, first of all, you can take advantage of the Pollinator Initiative Program through the Flathead Valley Conservation District that I mentioned in there downstairs if you want to visit with them. There's also cost share funding programs for pollinator habitats through um, NRCS. And that is where they will help offset the costs of you um, putting in much more um, of the pollinator habitat. And then um, consider cover crops and animal foraging. Um, one of the things that I went through, this is Mark Shepard's book, Restoration Agriculture. And he talks about how there needs to be a paradigm shift in our agriculture in order to support our pollinators. And one of the big things, that there's an entire chapter in here devoted to beekeeping. And he talks about using cover crops. If you use cover crops, they almost always include legumes. And those are flowering and are great for our pollinators. And there's benefits to your soil and your property if you use those. So that's a great reference. Difference. And also consider animal foraging. Um, I, when I first bought my property, I immediately put a bunch of dry pasture on it and started haying year after year. And it only took four years for my yields to go from um, nine tons on five acres. I'm now down to five tons on five acres. And it's because I am depleting the, the soil of nitrogen and calcium, sending it off to somebody else for their animals to get to eat and losing it on my property. And so I'm going to bring in this year, we're gonna start uh, sheep foraging on our property to try to increase the ground. Now you're probably thinking, okay, I came here about beekeeping. Why are you talking about your sheep <laughs> and your soil? Because I want you to understand that bees are only as healthy as our agriculture, which is only as healthy as our bees, which is only as healthy as our agriculture. It's a constant cycle that they talked about at Apomondia, about how we need to in, do paradigm shifts in the way that we farm, in the way that we purchase, in the way that we vote with our dollar to try to improve the insect biomass and especially, especially honeybees. So the more sustainable you can make the property that you're on, the more that all of our wildlife is going to benefit. Um, so as a farmer gardener, what is safe for you to use? Well, first of all, um, a safe pesticide for veggie gardens is Bacillus thuringiensis, and it's called Bt. So you might have heard of it, it revert to as Bt. You can get it at your um, local garden store. It is target specific. There are different Bt's. There are bacteria that actually wreck the gut of that particular insect that it's targeting so that they essentially starve to death. And um, so that is target um, specific. 
just keep in mind that um, I'm probably going to butcher how to pronounce this. Isawai, maybe, Isawai, is toxic to honeybees. So when you're picking your lines of your BT, you need to avoid that one entirely. And I would still avoid, as I talked about, putting that on flowers in general. It's one of those things where they say, well, it doesn't kill them, but I don't know that it's technically safe, right? Um, and then reconsider regenerative agriculture instead of biocides. Um, here are these people that I've mentioned today, Mark Shepard, Gabe Brown, Jonathan Lundgren. They all have books. They all have YouTube videos out there. And then um, I got to meet um, a really neat gal. Her name is Sarah Redlaird. Um, she is a graduate from the entomology program at the University of Montana here, and she is over in Oregon, and she is helping farmers do regenerative agriculture um, in order to improve pollinator health. So definitely go check out her website, beegirl.org, for more ideas. And um, that those are some really great resources for everyone. Um, I believe there's another guy in here, Ray Archuleta. I didn't put him down. Um, Google him and what he's calling the slake test. It's a very interesting test that I did on my soil about how if you put it in water, how it immediately slakes off. And it can show you how poor your soil really is. And I compared the soil that has been tilled on my property for probably se several generations versus the one that's down in my um, river bottom with trees and all sorts of good forage. And it was insane, the difference on the test. The one that has been tilled for decades, just it collapsed in a pile of sand, literally, at the bottom of the slake test, and it's in water. And then the other one held together because it had so much great organic matter and hadn't been touched in the riverbed. So definitely check him out too. You'll like, you'll like what you see there. And for commercial beekeepers, if you're a commercial beekeeper, um, you you need to talk to, um, when you're taking your bees down for pollination, try to get involved with the farmers. We kind of vilify the almond farmers as if they're what's destroying the whole country. No, the almond farmers are great people that are trying to feed their families. They just need education and they need us to collaborate with them. What you need to do in your orchards is you need to have um, hedge grows and to actually sustain the wildlife and for the pollinators and for birds and snakes and all of the critters that need that. And the problem is that when they go down, they have a sanitary dirt floor for the in the almond groves, and there's no beneficial diverse um, forage for the bees. And so if we can work with them, educate them, if you ever have an opportunity to work with them, um, also within our communities, if you ever have an opportunity, that would be the ideal um, for us to try to improve our um, agriculture, our commercial agriculture. So with that, any questions? Um, yes. What about uh, napweeds? The napweeds we have yes. gotten a piece of property that we have bad napweed in. You have to use pesticides to get rid of that. Um, it's also very poor soil. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I need to do to, to turn that into something that will, you know, grow something else that attracts bees. Well, so first of all, napweed honey is absolutely delicious. I don't know if you realize that. Are you saying that because it's being ordained by the county for you to get rid of it? Well, neighbors or yeah, there, there's enough there that it's a matter of time. Right. Or someone calls and says, "This guy's you know, field is." bringing napweed to my field. Right, right. So um, if you contact the, um, so that if you contact the NRCS down in Ronan specifically, although they do have a few people that work out of this office here that know, but there's a gentleman, Ben Montgomery, and he um, would be a really good resource for you for how can I safely eradicate, because the thing you need to realize about weeds and grasses, even quackgrass, which is, oh my gosh, the bane of my life. Quackgrass is there it's nature's way of covering the soil and getting in where there is poor soil and fixing it. And it fixes erosion and it increases organic matter. So you have to determine what is wrong with my soil that the napweed wanted to even be here and then that's what you need to fix, right? I, and so- well, I know what was wrong with it is they stripped it off and sold the good topsoil. Uh-huh. Yes, yes, 
yes. And these kind of resources are going to be amazing for you. Seriously, Google, Gabe Brown, Mark Shepard. Um, you know, if you want to get their books, you can. But definitely reach out to Ben Montgomery down at the NRCS office in Ronan, and he can help you. And he does no-till seeding, so tilling um, is really, really hard on our soils. It breaks up all of the porous aggregates that are supposed to be there, and it destroys the organic matter. Not having a cover on your soil at all times. Nature will try to cover it if you haven't. And so those are all elements that are explained in these books and by these gentlemen, if you want to Google. And then also reach out to maybe Sarah, the bee girl, and ask her through her website what she would suggest. She's working with farmers in Oregon to try to find alternatives for these kinds of things. Yeah. Would it be beneficial, like the um, weevils and stuff that they have for knapweed, to maybe release some of those on the I'm I'm sorry, I don't know anything about those, so maybe reach out to the NRCS. However, um, in all of my background, my science background and biology background, I have never seen an instance where introducing a new critter helped. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 it does. It does. But, I mean, they would be the experts, so I don't want to answer that. Did I see another hand? Yes, in the back. Uh, what, uh, what food sources? would uh, the bees expect to find in the national forests? Oh, that's a great question. There are the trees themselves. If there's any of your blooming trees, bees actually collect way more nectar from trees than they do an entire field of flowers. Um, so trees are your, please plant trees. They're your best bet. Some of the things that the trees, uh, that the bees love, willows um, are a great forage. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Linden trees, but there's a different name for them here. Mm -hmm. it starts with a B. I'm sorry, linden trees. Um, there, um, obviously, any of your fruit trees. Um, there are so many wildflowers in the forest, especially if there's areas where there's been burns. Those are the greatest for the bees because after the burns, the weeds come in, the natural um, wildflowers come in. They're technically weeds. The wildflowers come in and those are great forage. Um, my predecessor that was here before that used to do these talks, Wade Foley, he's, um, he's moved down into the um, Paradise Valley area, but he used to keep bees right smack in the middle of the forest not near any what you would think would be any forage and they were teeming with honey every year so some somewhere the bees are getting stuff from the forest yes that that's wonderful yes solutions for changing a paradigm with the agro business i know <laughs> i know i wish i had the answer to that um Probably, I, I don't know if these gentlemen do a better job in the end of talking about how we would shift that paradigm, but they're, they're bigger heads than me that need to talk about that. Um, we vote with our dollar, right? So, you know, just think about trying to make change. It's, it's, it's Gabe, um, Gabe Brown says something that's amazing to me. He said, if you want to, oh, hey, let me make sure I, I do this correctly. If you want to make small changes, change what you do. If you want to make big changes, change how you think. And if you kind of pull back and look at things from a greater scale of, okay, what are we doing? I haven't even touched on some of the other benefits of the agriculture that they're talking about. This is a solution to all of the extra carbon that's in the air. We are not capturing our carbon out of the air and putting it into the ground at the rate that we have been historically because of the way that we practice now. The carbon just cannot be pulled out of the ground if we're, take, if we're tilling and taking everything off of the land and removing it. And so it's, there's a lot of potential solutions here. And I think this is gaining steam like crazy. Check out the Rodell Institute. Um, on Facebook also or their website. The Rodell Institute is looking into permaculture and regenerative farming. Getting in with those people and asking them, what can I do to help move you forward? Because as an individual, there's not much you can do. You can't control anything but what's on your property and what you vote for with your dollar. Great question. Yes. I just wanted to plug a resource. Uh, I work with Penn State, and they have a great center for pollinator research. They okay. Have the latest, greatest research on, and they have, have all kinds of things about bees, not just honeybees, and how to make your own houses for every type of bee, what the beneficial plants are, depending on the soil, 
Uh, and if you're a gardener, there's a work out of MIT where they have tested every single soil and plant in the mm -hmm. world in their, um, in their science labs. And so they can tell you exactly the chemical composition needed for every plant on Earth. So if you're growing a specific type of tomato in your greenhouse, they can tell you exactly what needs to be in there uh, and what to put in. Okay. All the organics that we need to put in there. And one more time, how would everyone find their website? They would Google? They would Google Penn State uh, Center for Pollinator Research and, uh, and for MIT. It's, it's an MIT lab for uh, agriculture and sustainability. Very good. Very good. Does anyone have any questions about capturing bees? Sorry. Yes. In the back. You, want, you want to capture a swarm? Yes. We've, uh, we've seen a swarm two years ago on the property in stump. There you go. And when they weren't swarmed, they mm -hmm. were nested in the stump. Yeah. So that's, that's our goal is to try to capture a swarm this year. Okay, so um, do you have equipment already that you can utilize? The basic hive. Okay, there you go, that's all you need is one, one deep and just put, so when you do your frames, um, don't put foundation in every single frame. Um, I know that that might be tempting because you don't want the bees to do cross comb, but the problem is the bees like the sense of space. Um, I have a video of the bees measuring my hive. If you've read um, Honey Bee Democracy by Tom Seeley is a wonderful book about from beginning to end how bees choose where to live. They vote through a democracy. The queen does not tell them. The queen, the, the word queen is a misnomer. <laughs> she makes absolutely zero decisions in the hive. She's a slave, a glare, and that's all she is. The workers make the decisions and they do them based off of pheromones and they do them as a collective entity and um, with almost an intelligence collectively. And the bees will come in and I actually saw, um, oh, I'm having a hard time turning this simply because it's touching the ground there. Um, I have video of the bees coming and running circles around the entrance, measuring it. Why? Well, because bees, Tom Seeley found that bees prefer four square inches exactly of an opening. Now we replicate that through our reducers by having a half inch tall by four inch long reducer. That's two square inches that the bees, so that we, you know, we're following that. But they're actually like sitting there measuring it. And then they're going inside and you heard this little sound is thap, 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 thap everywhere. The bees are literally hitting the sides. They're flying from one side to the other, measuring it. Because bees prefer, they realize, Tom C. they realize, 40 liters in size. And that's what this is here. Now this here is from, a, this is a lay-ins trap that I built. Like I said, you can build a lay-ins hive for free or the traps for free. You can get them off of horizontalhives.com website. But you see how much deeper this is than a standard frame? And the idea being these do better in our winters up here because the bees move up one millimeter a day in their cluster. And on a regular standard frame, they're gonna hit this after about five inches worth of honey and have nowhere to go. Now, some people have a second box up above, but sometimes the bees will not cross this wood and the space and the wood of the frame above them before they finally get up to the honey if they're slightly weak and they're not a strong hive. Here they have an inter inter uninterrupted move all the way up here. So these are great for um, um, our northern winters. A lands, oh, the, the website itself, horizontalhives.com. Honeybee Democracy, yeah. And, um, Oh, there's a little spider running around like crazy off of that. Um, this is where the, they came in the trap and started building their honeycomb. The bees did. So, um, But I would not put foundation in every single frame because the bees like the space. And definitely check out that book to understand how bees decide where they want to live. Um, yeah, so a lot of people use plastic foundation that goes all the way down the frame in their hives, and that's fine if you already have the bees in a hive to keep them from doing cross comb in crazy directions. But in a trap, you do not want it filled every frame with foundation. It will, it will not be desirable to the bees. Some people do every other frame with a foundation, or you could do strips, starter strips up at the top, a foundation to wax or plastic. 
Um, I would have some amount of comb. Now this comb is gonna be attractive to the bees, but even more so comb that's had brood in it. And the comb that's had brood is always black from the cocoons of the bees. They love that smell. I have another great video on Facebook if you guys wanna check it out where um, somebody asked me to come get a swarm of bees and rather than have to pull them off with my hands, I simply took a frame of brood and set it right next to the swarm and the queen just stepped right off of the cluster and right onto, she's like, I'm home, there's babies here. This is where I'm supposed to be. And then I just picked up that frame and I set it in a box and closed it up and I came back four hours later when it's dark and every one of those bees was inside that hive closed it up took it home bees so it's really that easy sometimes it's a lot of fun and it really increase it it really um just moves it up a notch in your beekeeping above just buying the bees and bringing them home and I, i'm not judging anybody if that's what they have to do the first time that's what i did it's fine but i just want you to know there's an alternative I th i've got one question over here and i'll come back to you yes sir uh, I was just curious, are there particular months that work better for you as far as baiting the bees go? Yes, so the moment the dandelions bloom, that's when you're going, they're going to start thinking about swarming and you're gonna find swarm cells. So um, I kind of, my rule is have the traps ready by April, put our, have them ready this year? Oh. <laughs> Maybe the beginning of April, possibly putting them out the end of April. I don't know, we may get our dandelions in April this year, but have them ready so that you can put them out for the dandelion bloom. And then I was catching swarms as late as the last week of July last year. Yes. So do you have to put a fence around your hives to keep the bears out and the animals? If you know that there are bears in the area, yes. Not for general animals, but for the bears. Um, there is a program, the Wildlife Defenders Program, through our Fish and Wildlife Parks, and they will help you design it. They'll come out and do a consult, and then they'll give you $500 reimbursement towards the cost of the electric fence. What is that called again? Wildlife Defenders. And um, a lot of people, um, so a bear technically, if he really wants it something, or she probably usually, because uh, she's feeding her babes, um, will just barrel through a fence. So a lot of people bait the bears initially to teach them by putting a slab of raw bacon hanging on one of the electrified wires. And the bear comes up and she touches her nose to it and she learns this is electrified and she'll run off without ever actually going through the fence. Did it? <laughs> yeah, any other questions? Yes. So if you're interested in just getting started, does your club <laughs> kind of help people along that? We, sh we sure do. Or? We sure do. Yeah, um, if you come to the club meetings, um, we, um, we always like allow people just to ask questions in general, the new people. Um, we'll usually have a speaker there that's talking about one particular um, aspect of beekeeping each month. And then we have mentors. And um, I realized in quick order um, that not everybody likes Facebook. Imagine that. And when everyone was here, and so I'm working on creating an actual website that will have a lot of our go-to 101 information on the website, including a mentor sign-up page so that people don't have to use Facebook to connect with us. They can just use a website. And we'll um, actually even come out to your house um, the mentors in the club and like help you do an inspection at least one time to kind of understand what you're seeing. I'm also offering a beekeeping 101 course here through the continuing education through FVCC. It'll be part of their May to August catalog release. So look for that too. What um, part of that will be a class instructional here. And then um, the second day we'll be going out into my apiary and doing an inspection. Uh, <laughs> that depends. We have beekeepers all over the valley. And so if there's somebody that tends to be your dress, <laughs> where are you guys located? I should ask you for a comment. Lincoln County? Oh, my parents are over there. You lucked out. I have a reason. I have a reason to be in Libby. Now, are you Eureka or Libby? Eureka. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> maybe maybe if, you, if you provide lunch, I'll do it. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Any other questions? We got 10 minutes. You sure? There's nothing. Should we try to see if we can find my videos on YouTube since we couldn't? Um, hopefully, I won't be blocked here.
Um, the last Tuesday of every month, uh, 6 to 6.30, socializing, 6.30, we kick into the meeting, and they're at the Flathead Valley um, County Health Department. Yeah. And um, there, um, as far as capturing, it didn't come up with, that was one of the slides that it didn't come up on, but let M B, L E T M B E E dot com. Um, that's a good friend of mine, and he talks about every aspect of trapping you can ever imagine. He's been doing it for years, several different ones. So check him out. Mm -hmm. When I was in Austria, it was, um, I saw it. Like a little house that they had the beehives in, there were several hives in here, and there was in the entrances uh -huh. facing the outside wall, and it was probably an evil for protection in the winter, but do you think that would be enough protection against the bears too? Um, I I don't know. I mean, bears are t bears will completely tear a chicken coop apart. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, I would say. Now, um, you know, I could cover for, since we have five minutes, is um, how I winterize here. If you want to check out, I have a polystyrene hive downstairs at the table. Polystyrene is, uh, it's, a, it's like a form of uh, plastic styrofoam, but it's super heat, super compressed, has a very high R value. I had better success wintering in those this winter than some of the other um, winters that I've done in the traditional wood boxes. Um, one of the things Tom Seeley talks about in his book, The Lives of Bees, is that what he's finding in the trees is very, very thick walled trees, you know, several inches um, that are insulating for the bees. And that the way that people keep bees down in California is not necessarily how we're going to do it up here in Montana, right? And so you really need to have your bees insulated. So um, all of my club members this year, they either purchase polystyrene hives like I did, or they purchased the two inch blue board and they wrapped around the outside of their hives with a blue board. And then the next thing that I tested is vent bees, ventilation or no ventilation. We've always heard that the moisture kills the bees. Well, if you read Tom Seeley's research, no, the bees need the moisture. What do they need the moisture for? Well, they need moisture for their brood. And once they start rearing their brood later in the, in the winter, they need it for themselves. In order to consume honey, bees need water in order to break the honey down, right? And so if you're robbing them of all of the water in the hive, you're potentially, they're thirsting to death. What kills the bees is if condensation forms on the roof above them, drips onto them, and then it freezes them. So what I did in my hives was I made sure that there was more insulation above the bees than on the sides. And then what happened was the, any condensation that formed, formed on the sides, safely away from the bees. The bees could get over and collect the water if they need to through the winter, but it doesn't drip on them and kill them. So I've changed over to a system where I am not ventilating the tops of my hives with quilt boxes anymore. More. I did it with a couple just for testing. They're the ones that didn't make it. Very, very healthy hives, huge boxes. I have 100 pounds of honey left that they just never made it to. And I had um, weather sensors in all of the hives because this is part of my um, research that I'm doing for my master's certification in beekeeping this summer with the University of Montana. So I had weather sensors in the boxes and reading to a weather station digitally for me. And that all of my hives that were ventilated were always almost 10 degrees lower than the ones that weren't ventilated. But you have to, if you're gonna do the no ventilation system, you have to do it safely so that condensation's not gonna form above the bee's head. And there's a group, there's a gentleman that I met at Apomondia, his name is Etienne Tardef, and he has a Facebook group, uh, Beekeeping North of 60. He's keeping bees in the Yukon, in zone one, in polystyrene hives without ventilation. And he, it was a joy to talk to him. I just picked his brain for hours. And he said, any of us down here in Montana are welcome to join his Facebook page. If you look through Facebook, North, North, Beekeeping North of 60 in the Yukon. And he is going to be visiting us. I don't know if any of you heard, but the Western Apiculture Society is putting on a beekeeping workshop down at the University of Montana in Missoula this July. You can go Google if you want to check out their website. He is going to be there. He's driving down from the Yukon. And so, and I'll, I'll be attending that. It's, it's for the entire Western Apiculture Society. So that would be a great workshop. You can either do the classes or the workshop or both. And um, you can learn a lot about beekeeping down there. Yes? Is that the college down in 
Missoula? Yep, Missoula College. Mm -hmm. Just Google. Western Apiculture Society. And, they, and the, right on the front page, they'll have an event that you can, and you can sign, you can register now. What was that guy's name again? Um, oh, Etienne Tardif. Beekeeping north of 60 in the Yukon is him. You can get bees through the winter here. If you wind break them from their south and east and west sides, or sorry, north, east and west sides, and if you, you know, use insulation. And so far, only one person in my club that I know of has lost all her bees, and that's because she had one. <laughs> and that's very common here. Well, as you saw, 40% losses yeah, across, so. Um, I only use the follower boards in my lay-ins because it's a horizontal hive. So a lay-ins hive is horizontal, it's not stacking. And if you give the bees too much space initially, they can't fend off predators, the, the brood gets chilled. So when I first move these five frames that are nicely drawn out out of a trap into my, um, I put in a follower board and then I increase it and add new frames for them. And um, it is possible to keep top bar hives in Montana. A gentleman over in Great Falls just posted to the Montana Beekeeping Forum that his top bar made it, top bar hives. Top bar is a horizontal one. It's very shallow. And a lot of people say, you can't keep top bar. He did it in Great Falls, <laughs> where the wind chill is like negative 100. <laughs> he somehow did it, yeah. So, <laughs> yes. So just a question. Uh -huh. um, I've been reading about the honey flow, the hives. Yes. What do you think about that? Um, so the flow hives are not as much a type of a hive as they are a conversation about honey extraction. So um, the base, the bodies of a flow hive are your traditional bases that we use in all of our Langstroth style. It's that the supers um, are made in such a way with a plastic um, frames that when you shift a key, the whole entire frame shifts and it breaks and the honey drains out into a jar. That's all that is. The base of it is still your basic normal beehive. I've heard 50-50 success stories in whether the bees will actually utilize those frames in a flow hive. But I would say that um, with, if it's incredibly expensive, you can buy honey from people cheaper than you could potentially get a flow hive. So it's, um, it's a neat idea. I just think it's too hit and miss. Um, there's somebody who actually uh, came up to the table this morning that wondered if Wade Foley, who in tam Tamarack Apiaries, was able to resell her flow hive components for her because she didn't like them and he hasn't been able to sell them to anybody. No one wants to buy them, so, yeah. Yes? Um, getting equipment for beekeeping right here. I know there's a place for down in Polson. Yes, Western Bee. I, I was trying to find out more about Tamarack Apiaries that you just mentioned. And I guess they used to have a location in Housefell. They did, over by Woodland Park. You can still get equipment from them. Reach out to them through their Facebook page. He's willing to bring a delivery up here if he has to. Wade, that's Wade Foley. Yeah, he could do that. Um, Murdoch's has beekeeping equipment. You can get it cheaper from Western Bee, though, because it's commercial wood. Um, also, please check out Craigslist. A lot of people are getting some really good used equipment off of Craigslist. Just ask the person when you go there, have them verify that it, they did not have American fowl brood in their colonies. And it's very rare American fowl brood any, anymore up here, but it happens enough that you would, because the spores live for 40 years. In a, in a hive equipment. So you wanna make sure that they didn't die from that. You can tell by talking to the person if they know what they're talking about. If it says, oh, it was my grandfather and it's been in an attic for 10 years, uh, I don't know, take your chances, <laughs> you know? It's up to you, but. So we're all done, it's past two o'clock. Thank you so much, everyone, I appreciate it. Thank you.